Thank you, Bowden. And once again, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Ryan Johnson. I'm a Solutions Engineering Manager with F5 Government Solutions. Uh, today, we have a group of exciting guests, uh, mostly from the federal space to discuss uh, zero trust in theory and kind of define, uh, you know, talk about the implementation of zero trust. Um, <clears throat> once again, you know, there are five poll questions. Please try to answer those. We'll make this recording available after the fact. And uh, without further ado, let's jump into the introductions here. First off, I have uh, Scott Rose with NIST. Scott, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm Scott Rose. I'm currently at the Information Technology Lab at NIST, um, and I am the co-author of the NIST special publication 800-207, uh, Zero Trust Architecture, um, and also attached to the, uh, as a subject matter expert for the upcoming NCCOE, or National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, uh, project on Zero Trust Architecture. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, if anyone hasn't uh, had a chance to read that 800-207, definitely take a look. It's, it's well worth your time. Next off, we have uh, Gerald Curran, uh, who is with uh, HHS. Gerald, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm on detail to HHS, but technically I am the, representing the Department of State, um, the, um, the NSES. I'm the Director for Enterprise Network Management at the Department of State, um, basically the infrastructure. Uh, person, do the network, Active Directory, a lot of the security implementation aspects of things. Uh, I am participating and starting to co-chair the CIO's Innovation Council Working Group on Zero Trust. Uh, I am forced or certified in Zero Trust as a strategist as well. Very good. Thank you, Gerald. Next up, we have uh, Jason Wilburn with uh, F5 Networks. He's a identity and access guru or SME, if you will. Uh, uh, Jason, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. So I'm a system engineer covering the system integrator space uh, for F5 Federal. But as Ryan mentioned, I am also the co-lead for SME UA, which is all, anything related to access and authorization controls for our access policy manager product. Cool. Thank you, Jason. Next up, we have uh, Brandon Iski uh, with DISA. Brandon, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, thank you, Ryan. Um, so I'm Brandon Iski. I'm the chief engineer for our uh, security enablers portfolio. So that includes uh, uh, ICAM or Identity and Credential Access Management, uh, Zero Trust Reference Arch Architecture Development, uh, Public Key Infrastructure, PKI, and then Software Defined Enterprise. Um, so I'm part of the Defense Information Systems Agency. Again, it's a combat support agency to the Department of Defense. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brandon. So we'll spend uh, about 35 to 40 minutes around one until about 1 45 uh, discussing with the panel and then we'll save a little time for a Q&A. Uh, please try to make these uh, vendor agnostic questions, not F5 related. If you want to submit an F5 question, we'll be happy to table that, you know, take it back and, and answer it after the fact. But we'd like to keep this, you know, as vendor agnostic as possible. Uh, there are two topics we're going to talk about. Uh, the first is uh, the theory behind zero trust, you know, understanding federal zero trust straight from the source. And the second topic is, you know, the reality, the implementation of zero trust. So jumping into the first topic, the theory, uh, this question to you, Scott Rose, you're one of the authors of NIST 800-207, Zero Trust Architecture. Can you tell us briefly what problem zero trust is trying to solve and what are the main goals? Uh, well, um, yeah, zero trust is kind of a new paradigm of how you want to look at enterprise security. Uh, basically, it's it's taking a lot of the trends that, that we saw kind of going, you know, emerging over the last 10 years or so and kind of building them together and layering them together uh, to kind of solve what we've, you know, you kind of see as like kind of the attacks that the, the common script from attacks that you see going out there is where the initial breach happens, the attacker then moves laterally through the network. Uh, and then, you know, performs the actual attack, ransomware, data, exfil, whatever. Um, and then it's, they're not discovered until the next audit, you know, some six, eight months later. Um, Zero Trust tries to kind of minimize that kind of, you know, attack scenario where uh, you, you segment away or micro segment away resources. Uh, you do endpoint security. You do strong authentication both inside the infrastructure, you know, on-prem as well as outside coming in to kind of limit that lateral movement and make sure that every connection uh, from a client to an enterprise-owned resource is both authenticated and authorized. Uh, so the idea is that you want to try, 
you know, if, if you, you, you don't, don't rely on your perimeter defenses anymore, but you're doing it every step of the way. So there's a, like a little mini perimeter around like now every resource and every user. And so that, you know, so you always have total, you know, or at least more knowledge, not total knowledge of what's going on in your enterprise. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> this question, next question is to you, Gerald. What is the biggest misconception about zero trust? First of all, is level setting on the definition that I find is, is most difficult and people really understanding. And, and no offense to any of the vendors here, um, but the, depending on who you talk to, they kind of spin the definition their own way. So getting that common understanding of what zero trust is, is really important. Um, some people think it's identity. Um, but it's a little more than that, right? Um, as Scott was saying, it's about protecting what's important and, and shifting that paradigm and that, and that culture that we do. We're very compliance focused culture. Um, FISMA makes us that way, Fatara scorecards, things like that. Um, but we're, we're, I think zero trust gets us to a more effective cybersecurity posture. Um, we're common, commonly, we've done that peanut butter spread approach where we try to protect everything equally, um, which Frederick de Great says, you know, if you try to protect the equi everything equally, you protect nothing. I picked that quote up basically, but um, great IT innovator that he was. Um, but really that peanut butter spread approach is not sustainable. You can't cover everything. You can't, you know, you, 100, being 100% 100 patched when you have 109,000 workstations across the world is pretty unlikely. Um, so what's important, uh, as Scott was talking about, what's important? And definitely if you need to understand what zero trust is, uh, and, and you're grappling with that definition, yes, definitely don't suggest, but do read 800-207. Um, and and I, I believe, and Scott would agree with me, that that's going to morph as new technologies and capabilities and concepts come about, that that is going to morph and mature as, as we go along on this journey as well. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. <clears throat> this next question is to uh, Brandon. Looking ahead, what are the next or the biggest stumbling blocks for creating a zero trust environment? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so, so from my perspective, I think within DISA and, and the DoD, again, uh, we're a very large uh, environment. So I think from our, our vantage point, um, just trying to set, set the standards is really what, where we're at. So again, we very much leverage the 800-207 as a, as a framework for DoD uh, and, and what we develop for the, the zero trust reference architecture. Um, so we've uh, recently approved that. So that's available internal to DoD right now. Um, so that's that's kind of our way to get the common uh, framework and language and taxonomy uh, established across the department. Um, other trends we see again a lot of the a lot of the pillars of zero trust really do rely on existing capabilities and cybersecurity efforts that we have. And and from my vantage point, I think there are a few gaps. Uh, uh, in, the, in those technologies, at least for what the department has, has adopted from an enterprise perspective. And, and so I'll talk on some of those. But again, I think it's, it's, those it's making sure we're doing the existing capabilities, whether it's ICAM, whether it's endpoint, whether it's uh, network segmentation, um, all those things really start, have to start coming together. And again, it's, it's eliminating those stovepipes and enabling more uh, API access to these capabilities, tighter integration, and really trying to drive towards conditional access. Uh, beyond just what we do with uh, PKI, CAC, or PIV today. Uh, the one gap I see that uh, the department has been uh, looking at pretty heavily across, across the board is, is, is how do we access our uh, IL-5 cloud environments from commercial internet. And really with uh, COVID and, and mass telework, that's been a big challenge for us is to, is to enable uh, secure uh, collaboration and, and access to applications and data, but still from kind of most of us being kind of off the network. And so uh, for DoD, that's a, that's a big challenge because a lot, in those cases, a lot of our designs kind of assume all the users are on inside the perimeter. Um, so this, this concept really changes that and, and on its, or turns, it, turns the problem on its head. Um, so again, that secure access, um, we're, we're also looking at kind of some of, the, some of the, the SASE type capabilities or secure access edge um, capabilities. Um, but even in that space, the DoD is large. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to just use one vendor across the board. So, so trying to drive interoperability of those capabilities, looking at uh, what's kind of best of breed, but also how can we, like, I, I don't want to have 10 agents on my computer just to be able to get to different applications across the department. 
Um, so those are some of the, the big challenge I think we still see us ahead uh, beyond just kind of the obvious uh, cultural challenges, uh, getting everyone to kind of uh, understand the concept, build their kind of maturity model towards that, uh, and then adopt these concepts and integrations. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you. This is not a single vendor uh, solution by any means. This will be a, a grouping of different vendors uh, to, and you know, maybe some homegrown stuff to, to address these type of issues. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, next question is to Jason Wilburn. Zero Trust makes identity the new perimeter. Why does Zero Trust take this approach? That's a fun question. That's <laughs> right. Loaded. So, well, so one of the things that I always laugh when I hear that it's the new perimeter because I've heard that it's the new perimeter for like 10 years, right? I think I even have a coin from F5 <laughs> from like eight years ago that said identity is the new perimeter. Um, so I guess my car, my wife's car that's like 10 years old is still new to her. Um, but so the fact is, is identity really is a linchpin in a zero trust infrastructure, right? Because without identity, you can't really secure anything, right? Because we have to know who that person is or who, what is making that request, right? And that becomes really important in a, in a couple of things. One, it's the account creation. Are we creating accounts? Where do those accounts live? And how many entities of that identity actually exist throughout an organization, right? Because the identity of John Smith can exist in multiple places. Really what we're trying to do is get the reduce the number of identities down to really holistically one single identity for say John Smith. But also the next piece in that is really getting down to how they authenticate or how they assert themselves inside of the environment, right? And that really gets down to things like multi-factor enablement and, or if we can really get to the holy grail of going full password, right? which in the federal space, we do a lot of password list based authentication, doing things like smart cards, CAP, PIS, things like that. That's really what we're trying to do is truly validate that that user is who they really are because to, to really achieve zero trust, a lot of things revolve around one, knowing who that user is. And then once that user starts doing things within the network, really should he be able to do those things in those networks? right, based off the permission levels and their user behavior and the device they're coming from and where they're going to. But it all really revolves around the first step and that's just that user count and then truly identifying who that user is. Yeah, and that uh, kind of ties into what everyone else has said as well, Jason, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. the, uh, <clears throat> the Ryan, can I, can, I, can I add something to that question? Absolutely. That identity as the new perimeter thing really scares me because then people get super focused on identity and saying that's zero yeah. trust. And that's just a, uh, for lack of a better term, a pillar, right? And everything Jason right. said is absolutely important. But um, if Jason's account got compromised, for instance, what's the first two questions probably the cyber guy is going to ask that's, that's looking at the problem? What did he have access to? And is there exfil? So it actually becomes about the data um, more than anything right. So it's about protecting that data at the end of the day. So I think it's really important. And I think one of the things of I, that really in identity itself is we do it very linear today where it's one-time authentication, it's one-time access, and then, okay, have a nice day. It's got to be a constant dynamic checking and rechecking of many of the factors as well as authentication and access. It's got to be continuous. Yeah, I mean, and you're completely right, Gerald, right? I mean, identity really is just one more data point to determine access to something, right? Yeah, yeah totally agree. I just like to clarify that that's just one piece of it. <laughs> right. Of the overall right. picture. <clears throat> yeah. Not the entire, the entire enchilada, if you will. Correct. Because I see a lot no, of people talk no. about it that way. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that because a lot of places aren't doing that currently and uh, they think this is the solution, but it's just, like you said, part of the solution. Right. The, the enforcement point, right, like to take back to Scott's document, right, uh, with the 207, the enforcement points, right, they can, they will know about the identity, but the enforcement point takes in a lot more consideration beyond just the user's identity. 
right? There's all that telemetry data that we're getting in, right? What the machine's coming from, what they're trying to access, all these, all, there's lots more information than just the user identity to determine access control. Right, and it's not always a human, right? There's That's data right. flowing all the time and then there's data at rest, you know? So you gotta right. protect that. There's not always a human involved. Oh, uh, completely, right? So let's go down the road of like, what, what do we do with a service account, right? That's coming from an, uh, making an API call between one from one PC to another PC in the same data center, right? How do you validate that and secure that beyond really when I think a lot of times when we talk about zero trust, a lot of times we talk about remote users or just users in general talking to resources. And what we've been trying to get away from is saying, the user doesn't really matter where they live. They don't, whether they live in, in corporate environment or whether they, they live at home or they're in Starbucks, where the user lives, resides, doesn't really matter because at a network level, that's just an IP address, right? We care about one, how did they authenticate? And two, what device are they trying to access from, right? Not just is he on the corporate land. The corporate land gives, might give us more information, right? And more telemetry wise, just being on the Wi-Fi and Starbucks. But we, it's more than identity, definitely. One thing that, uh, you know, really hits home for me is, uh, you know, the proliferation of, you know, modern applications and, you know, APIs talking and everything. You got APIs on the cloud or even within the same agency or interagency or, or however. And, you know, Gerald's point about these non-human interactions, you know, verifying those, especially when it's so spread out, um, you know, different APIs. So to me, that really, that really hits home. <clears throat> The next question is to Scott. There are multiple architectures listed in the 800-207. Why would an organization choose one architecture over another? Um, basically, it's they need to look at the, whatever they're trying to push a zero trust architecture on, you know, what, what workflow, what mission they're doing, um, you know, all that will help decide, you know, what, which model will fit best for them. Um, you know, and also, you know, you got to take into account both, you know, what they may already have uh, owned or, you know, what, what technology needs they have, um, you know, what can they just, you know, have, what they can use anyway, just configure in a different way. Let's say they already went with vendor A and they have an installed base, but there are certain features that they're not using now, but, you know, as they move towards a zero trust architecture, they just turn those on. Um, you know, because some things work better than others. Some solutions require like agents installed. Uh, you may not be able to put agents on things, especially if you look at like trust or an IoT kind of deployment. Um, you can't push a lot of agents on these small form devices. Um, so you have to go with like a kind of a different model there. Uh, but when it comes to you know, like the approaches that we described, like the enhanced identity governance, micro segmentation, uh, software defined perimeters, um, I think of the most mature Kind of zero trust enterprises and architectures out there will have elements of all three. Um, you know, it's just basically we call those kind of those three approaches. We're 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 kind of calling those like what is what is the load bearing technology that you're using in your architecture, uh, whereas the models are more of you know what kind of products are you using that kind of dictates the model. Uh, whereas like what what are you where are you what technology are you putting the emphasis on whether you're the identity management governance part. Uh, the micro segmentation part, or kind of uh, using kind of a software defined networking or software defined perimeter for, uh, you know, model, all those stuff kind of depends on you know what you, what you when you're doing that initial analysis, both you know, what is the mission or workflow that you're trying to you're working on to try and make more secure, and then you kind of develop you know the set of policies and controls around those, and then that, those kind of guide you as to which kind of model that you may be going towards. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. Uh, next question is to Gerald. Looking into the future, what's next in Zero Trust? What technologies are going to impact Zero Trust security or require security in a different way than we see right now? Oh, man, technology moves so fast nowadays. You, you can't keep up. So, you know, as I'm speaking right now, something new has just come out that, that I don't know about. But, um, you know, Brandon, I think, mentioned SASE and, and, and edge computing. Um, I think that's something that people are very much looking at. Um, services through the cloud. Uh, one of the things, like, I advocate for that I'm looking at is I hate being tethered to an on-premise network. 
we're in a new normal. Everybody's working mobily now. I have to boomerang back just to go back out to the cloud on the internet. So, you know, how can I be untethered, but to have all the security that I need in telemetry to make the right decisions um, is something that I'm looking at. Um, so it's something that I advocate for as well. So technology is moving so fast. I think some, you know, are a little more mature than others in this space, but I, I see it's gonna be very much competitive because we're all looking this way now. And I think, as I said before, we're all trying to become more effective at our cybersecurity, not just check the mar check marks and, and being coming compliant. Um, we really need to protect the data um, and then the things that we need to protect. Like I equate, you know, I got to protect the crown jewels versus the bologna sandwich. You can have <laughs> my bologna sandwich, um, but I'm going to put my concentration on those crown jewels. So understanding what's important to you and understanding what the heck is your risk posture. You know, a lot of people struggle with, you know, accepting and understanding what their risk is. There is a lot of non-technical aspects to zero trust that people need to understand. The methodologies, what is your risk tolerance and, and the processes and what is the data and where is your data and what is that categorization of that data? Those are all non-technical things. And that there's a lot of work in those areas that people um, do struggle with that I find. So um, there, there's a lot. Um, but I see every day, you know, talking with a lot of vendors, th there's a lot of maturity in the space. And I just look forward to seeing some of the capabilities because there's a lot of concepts in 800-207. Like I talked about ongoing authentication and ongoing access. You know, right now it's very linear still. You know, that's something I, I think, you know, something that would be maturing that people are looking at doing. So there, I think there's a lot. And I'm looking forward to it because a lot of people are putting their emphasis here especially with what we just experienced with the solar winds. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus in this area now, even more so if there wasn't before. And Ryan, if I could add in there, I mean, I think, I think uh, Gerald is spot on. I think as we can build towards more uh, dynamic access, conditional access, and then having applications be aware of that context to uh, govern what I can and can't do within that application, I think that's where the where as all this comes together, those are the type of outcomes that we start to get at. Whether it's if I'm from a personal device and maybe a low assurance model, maybe I can't download attachments or something, but I can view those or view some content. So those additional granular controls, I think, start to come as out or become achieve or are achievable once we have some of these capabilities, additional access and, and aggregation of uh, telemetry together as well. Yeah. If I can jump in too, Ryan, I think that just being able to absorb the additional telemetry data, whether it be some sort of behavioral analytics coming out of a risk engine, uh, just coming out, out of various security tools. I think uh, Scott had mentioned this before, the breaking down of the silos between the team. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest things about Zero Trust holistically from a security model perspective, what we're saying is that, hey, it all needs to work together at a single point of control that is closest to the resource, right, that Gerald mentioned, right? So, and there can be some sort of context around it that no longer is it just the firewall blocking IPs and things like that, is and DLP looking at data XBIL and antivirus looking at what's happening on the server from a virus perspective or malware happening on the client. It all needs to work together and it all needs to come back because that becomes part of the behavior or of the workflow that's happening between the client and the resources, resources they're ac accessing so that we can truly understand, is this a permitted flow? Yeah, this is a permitted user coming from a permitted device to a resource that he should have allowed to. But based off not just what happened at the very beginning of the session, but what's happening throughout the life of the session, what's changing throughout the life of the session. That becomes critically important to really secure everything day one, right? Because back to Gerald's data exfil comment, right? Cool, you've got access to the data right now. Should you be able to exfil should you be able to download some document or upload some document five minutes into the session based off what something has changed? Maybe not. Yeah, I agree. That's where we're, we're trying to get, get to. Yeah. 
All right, that uh, concludes the the first topic, uh, the theory. Now we're going to jump into the second topic, the reality, you know, adopting zero trust. The first question is once again to Scott Rose. What components are available to federal entities to assist in forming zero trust architecture? Uh, well, most of these are kind of, you know, not real solid technologies, but it's kind of more of frameworks and things that may help. Um, I mean, there, there are existing government programs already out there, uh, both like a DHS, they have their CDM program, uh, there's FICAM, things like that. Things that. These are already in place to actually build these kind of like uh, what Daryl called you know, the pillars of zero trust. Um, they've already they've been in place for a while. And it's basically, we kind of looked at how zero trust kind of extends those, how those reliant on those kind of programs. Um, I mean, as well as we have uh, for NIST, there's the risk management framework um, that isn't the end all be all, um, but you can think of that as a kind of a tool to kind of help uh, go one level down. Once you just kind of develop that architecture, uh, the, the RMF can maybe help <clears throat> develop that kind of set of controls and checks in place to actually ensure that what you're doing, you're, you're implementing correctly and to, to your stated goals. Um, you know, these sort of, sort of things are in place that are, you know, right, are basically technology neutral that what, you know, whatever kind of vendors you're using, you can always kind of apply these kind of frameworks and tools to kind of help along the way. Um, and so, you know, in a way, and then this, the this, this special publication 800-207, um, let's also kind of think of that as a framework. Um, framing that just both, both on the architects, but also kind of the way that the architects can then talk to like the procurement people. So they can kind of hopefully understand what exactly you want. And so when procurement and the architects talk to the vendors, they're all speaking the same set of terms. They're not just throwing buzzwords back and forth at each other, like you know, randomly zero trust or, or something like that. Um, there's actually a set of like roles and, and, and uh, uses for these technologies that they can both kind of use as like a common set of terms. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. <clears throat> All right, uh, next question. Uh, thanks again for that, Scott. Uh, next question is to Gerald. Uh, what are the things an enterprise needs to understand before migrating to ZTA or zero trust architecture? That, that's a really good question. Um, and, and that's part of the think of the difficulty that some folks are going to have. Um, I mentioned the data, understanding the data, where it is, where it's going, and what classification it is, and, and the where it's going. Where is it normally go? What is the flow? What does normal look like? How do you baseline normal? Um, and that's going to be really difficult because kind of understanding what normal looks like will depend on when something happens now, what actions do I have to take? You know, um, so understanding, you know, where that data flow is, where the data resides, what it is, um, who owns it, because you're going to have to work with data owners. This is going to take a village. It's not just the network <laughs> guys, not just the IT guys. It's going to take a village. Um, to do a zero trust in, in my estimate at an agency. But, you know, as Scott was saying, be on the same page with terminology and things like that. Um, but I think that's kind of the difficult part. And I think that answers one of the questions is, you know, how do you know what abnormal is? Well, you got to know what normal looks like to know what abnormal looks like. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and then what's so I like the inside out method, you know, the start with the data and then, all right, what's facilitating access to that data? You know, device, app, you know, how do you, what do you do with those things? And then work back to the identity, given the right access to the right people at the right time. And we talk about this from the end user standpoint a lot. And I want to go back to this. The administrators as well are very powerful. So you have to address the administrators. And I think that gets lost a lot of times when people start talking about, you know, they talk about users accessing data. Well, your administrators need to be addressed as well in a zero trust. So that's something that's difficult. And the one other thing I would say that's difficult, Ryan, is that we all, as different agencies, we all share data. We all classify it differently. Like if I want to share with Brandon a certain amount of data, I do sensitive but unclassified, but he may classify it in a different way. Where do we meet? Um, when we want to share data with those different classifications so that we can properly do that. And, and then when I give Brandon my data, it's my data. He's got to be a good steward for it. If he doesn't have the right things in place, you know, now I've put my data out there. So how can we all get on that same page um, in interagency sharing is, I think, going to be a challenge as well. 
absolutely makes complete sense. That's a, that's a big, big challenge. <clears throat> Next question is for Brandon. Is it necessary to have a ZTA if the enterprise does not utilize cloud resources? Thank you for that question. Um, I, I would say absolutely. Again, the, the threat is the same whether you're in the cloud or not. Um, so whether you have uh, disconnected resources or closed networks or connected networks, I mean, you still have uh, very similar threats to some extent. Um, so I, I think it absolutely applies. Again, whether you look across the pillars, whether it's identity or, or endpoint, we still have to do those same things. And, and even what we're doing in DoD to enhance our, our identity and ICAM uh, processes, again, it's all about authentication and account lifecycle management. Um, those are the big pieces that we, we still have a long journey to, to get to from an enterprise perspective to, to get those under control uh, in a better fashion than what we do today. Um, we have CAC or PIV programs that are very strong, but again, those are a strong authenticator. It's the entire life cycle of, of the uh, additional pieces of identity that come into play. And again, the, all those same concepts apply regardless of where the data or applications uh, exist. Um, other efforts that we've done in this uh, arena as well, too, I would say, is our, our uh, cloud-based internet isolation. So again, this is a way that we move the end user browsing to a cloud environment to, for, actual, for our actual benefit. And so in this case, my, basically my browsing session is gonna be terminated in a cloud environment. And so from, from a data protection um, and exploit perspective, uh, those drive-by downloads basically would happen in that cloud environment, not on my endpoint. Um, so it actually comes to help us also in, in this mass telework environment as well too. So I can split my traffic going straight to the cloud for browsing and not backhaul that all the way back to the VPN to come onto the internal network. So uh, that's given us a few few uh, really big benefits. Again, in a, in a very hybrid model where in some cases we're using cloud in other cases, we still have a huge set of legacy that's still gonna be on-prem for the foreseeable future at, at, until they uh, modernize or whatever schedule they have to modernize. Brandon, if I could ask a question about the browser isolation component, mm -hmm. is this going to be in when a user is accessing internal resources inside of the agencies, or is this going to be also a service that's internet facing? So when a user's setting on prem or anywhere, right, and he's now going to the internet and wanting to go to Google, is all internet traffic really going to be browser isolated? Is that the, the, the envisioning? Uh, so it is what we're doing. So the 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 basically dot com or any commercial internet browsing mm -hmm. for that capability. Okay. And that's dot mil is is going to bypass that. And so whether I'm on a VPN or the the dot mil resource is already internet facing, um, those mm -hmm. are the nuances. So I mean, basically you have routing either way. So it does allow us to basically not be backhauling that traffic back onto the Doden or the internet for beauty terminology. For our internal network. Thank you, Brandon. Mm -hmm. Next question is to Scott Rose. Looking to the future, what is next in Zero Trust? What technologies are going to impact it or acquire it in a different way than what we see right now? Uh, um, I don't know. Good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know for sure because you know everybody makes predictions and they're constantly surprised about how they don't pan out. Um, but at least in the near term, I see a lot of people focusing uh, both on zero, uh, IoT, um, like uh, we are as well. Um, you know, how, how do you get those and manage those kind of a, in, an in an automatic fashion so you don't actually have to have human administrators going out and, and, and touching all those devices or doing something to those devices? Kind of the getting to the point where you can just quickly get them, onboard them onto a, net, onto a network. Um, you know exactly what they're doing because um, they say what they're doing and the, you know, the manufacturer vouches for them, you onboard them, you, you have go through the entire life cycle and you offboard them as you need to, all kind of a, in a more streamlined, automated fashion. Um, that's kind of going to be kind of coming on as, as people look for IoT solutions. Um, the other one is you're, we're seeing more uh, people looking at uh, machine learning uh, when it comes to kind of developing user profiles uh, as feedback to... Uh, kind of what, what we call like the policy engine or the, the trust algorithm going on. Um, kind of building up again, what, what does a normal, <clears throat> what does this user normally do? And then in order to see when something abnormal happens, you always use the scenario of um, you have a person like saying working in HR 
and they connect to this database with all the user information. And they do you know, roughly say three to five gigs of traffic going back and forth from this database a day. Suddenly you see that jump up to 800 gigs. Um, you know, that, that should cause a red flag going up because that's abnormal. Um, but then again, maybe it's because there's the you know, annual performance review where they're downloading everything and going through everything. Um, maybe that happens every year at a certain time. Then again, that's you know, you're building up that profile, saying, "Okay, we know that does happen at this certain time frame." Uh, so when it happens outside of that time frame, then maybe something strange is going on. Um, you know, th those kind of trends we're seeing uh, to try and kind of improve the the dynamic nature of zero trust. Um, that's that's kind of the things that are just kind of like on the horizon and starting to appear. Thank you, Scott. And next question is for Gerald. What mistakes or what are the biggest misunderstandings with zero trust in the industry or within federal entities right now? Definition, understanding the totality of zero trust, understanding it's a full architecture, a full framework. Um, people talk about it in bits and pieces. Um, unfortunately, you know, some vendors will, you know, talk about zero trust, but you got to understand the whole landscape of it because you know, they may come in, do the authentication and access management piece, but not do the data segmentation piece or, you know, the app hardening piece or, you know, network mapping for, for understanding where your data is flowing um, and things. So understanding that it's not just a one product thing. It is truly going to be an integration. It's going to take a whole effort, a whole village um, to, to do it. And so really understanding and getting level set and understanding the use cases and understanding what your risk tolerance is, um, is very important. You know, what are you willing to take risk for? Um, what's important to you? And putting your emphasis on what's important. Um, and, you know, the cafeteria schedule, okay. Um, but, you know, your medical records, uh, I'm going to put a little more emphasis on that probably um, than the cafeteria schedule. So really, and understanding where does that reside? How do I protect that? And, and things. So, it really understanding what it is you're trying to accomplish. And, and then we all have our little special snowflakes, all of our different agencies. So what is our little spin on things? Um, so understanding what your use cases are, I think is really important. Love your analogies. They always deal with food, <laughs> making me hungry. Yeah, I didn't uh, have lunch. <laughs> yeah, neither did I. Um, thank you, uh, Gerald. Uh, next question is for Jason. Uh, once again, another identity question, Jason. If identity is a new perimeter, what should federal agency entities consider when looking at making identity their enforcement point? How is this achieved? Well, it's still it's not going to be at the it's not going to be the enforcement point, right? It's just going to be another piece of information, a data point that can be used by an enforcement point, right? But it, as to Gerald's point, it needs to be looked at holistically, right? Identity just needs to be one part of it. I think the biggest thing is understanding really where where are all your identities within an organization? Are they all in Active Directory? Are they all in a SaaS-based IDAS? Do each application have their own directory structure? And so while you think that John Smith account only exists in, say, Active Directory, it might exist in multiple locations, right? So then you need a good strategy to onboard identity decommission identity and then also validate identity, right? That means back into needing some sort of MFA or a good authentication method. Thank you, Jason. Mm -hmm. Next question, we're kind of winding down with the questions here. We just have a, a couple more and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the, the uh, submitted Q&A from the, uh, the attendees. <clears throat> Next question is to Scott. What are the concerns a federal entity needs to understand before migrating to ZTA? Uh, well, I mean, the concerns they need to think you know, that they need to worry about is, um, is basically they need to know what they do. They need to know their mission. They need to know the risks uh, inherent to that they're doing their mission. Uh, and then they need to know what they have, you know, who both their, you know, the user accounts on the network, the devices, the workflows, they need to have those kind of knowledges first. Um, so they need to be able to detect and monitor things previously before they can actually start moving down this role to, to zero trust. Because you can't really build a policy 
and a set of checks around things that you don't actually know. Um, so, I mean, those, those are kind of like the main concerns. Um, other concerns are like, you know, how will it impact the users? Um, you need to, you know, to educate them and make sure everybody else is on board. Because if, if the other kind of uh, you know, operating units uh, in, a, in an organization or a federal agency or something, if they're not on board, um, you know, there's going to be a problem because, you know, uh, you know, because the way things are, because they may result in the changes of the workflow of you know, sometimes how they're accessing things, you know, what permissions they have or don't have. There's always that kind of learning curve when you're trying to actually refine these policies. And if that becomes aggravating, uh, they're going to start trying to find ways around it. And that's the last thing you want, because then you have the whole shadow IT kind of springing up behind it and things that you, you know, sort of all these strange traffic that you're not seeing on the network, but people claim that's very important for them to do their job. I mean, those, those sort of things. So you need to actually get, uh, you know, realize that you know, on going down the road of zero trust is, you know, a kind of a unified front. Everybody needs to take those steps together. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, probably the last question here. Um, this is directed to Gerald once again. Um, how does zero trust relate to TIC 3.0 and CDM? So I think the great thing about CDM, those of that have been participating in it, it sets a good uh, foundational things um, that I think you can build on for zero trust. I think Brandon said it um, well earlier. It's like, you're probably already doing some things um, and, and taking a good inventory of some of those efforts that you already have going on um, and how it fits into the zero trust architecture that, you know, so there may be some tweaks. Um, Tick, I think definitely is part of a uh, contributor to the um, solution, uh, especially, you know, some of these efforts that allow for the telemetry um, and the services to do that untethering that I was talking about and, and get all that data and make decisions based off that. Um, definitely. Um, I think the way CDM is taking in and doing like the asset discovery, um, a lot of the understanding of the mapping, um, eventually in the subsequent phases later on to do the network access control so you can quarantine or, or trigger an action on a device. There, there's a lot of good things that I think they provide some good building blocks that will get you a part of your zero trust solution. Um, not the totality, of course, we've already talked about that, but I think there's some good foundational pieces that they've put in place that contribute to the overall zero trust architecture. Yeah, and to follow up on that, um, if, if you go through like the, the part of the NIST 800-207, uh, um, we have a co-author from DHS, uh, and he's the head of the TIC program, and we made sure that at least the, the text that we had in those sections where we talk about CDM and TIC, um, you know, we had a lot of input and overview from DHS there. Uh, so we made sure that uh, you know, the, the wordings and, and the both and the tone on both kind of kind of mesh and they don't contradict. Um, so yeah, we, we, we made sure that, you know, that uh, we, we were expressing the fact that these programs are kind of uh, interlaced. Getting toward that common lingo. <clears throat> All right, that was the, uh, thank you, Scott and Gerald. Uh, that was the last question uh, for you guys directly. Um, I'm going to go into some of the submitted questions. We'll start with this one. Please discuss how uh, zero trust and cybersecurity can be supported for 5G architecture slash infrastructure. And I'll, anybody want to take that one? Any one of the panelists, which is? Uh, offhand, I don't know. And I think it's, it's also kind of a, an area that's still being explored. Because um, if you look at a lot of what the fire, 5G coming out right now, it's kind of like the, um, the, the new radio stuff, and it's basically you're only getting the increased speed uh, to the first hop of the tower. So basically, it's at that point, 5G is just your normal data transport, just like anything else you have. It's when we start moving down to the standalone kind of architectures where a lot more computing is getting pushed out into the network, uh, and that's not fully deployed everywhere yet. So we're not actually seeing um, kind of a lot of what could be done and emerging right there. Uh, but that's one of those things that we're kind of seeing as um, kind of a research area and a kind of a growth area uh, for both zero trust and, and 5G. Yeah, I think the other, uh, again, if you're deploying your own standalone networks, again, I think 
it's all, it's almost the same as cloud where I have an extension of my network to other other transports. Um, so, so from that perspective, I think there is a lot of similarity there that uh, will continue to expand in, in areas where where you are deploying your own robust 5G network, maybe less so than Wi-Fi or something. Um, again, it's just how you're extending either your perimeter or your edge or or even just a, a basic internet connection to be able to get back to your resources. Thanks, Brandon. We have a couple more. Ryan, if I can jump in real quick. Um, to me, right, as Scott had mentioned, right, 5G transport and a lot of the backend systems, right, they're, they're just servers or containers or something else running a set of radio networks, right? So those same systems still have to have some sort of control mechanism in them, right? Regardless of whether they're a, a website, right, like what we tend to think of when we think about zero trust and the user accessing a website or an internal resource. In this case, we're talking about accessing the control systems for the radio network to enroll a device, to, if you're doing cell phone calls, right, to make a call, those kinds of things. They're still going to have the same sense of control mechanisms that need to exist, right? You're still going to have to be able to control the identity, control the, 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 the user that's using the 5G network, right? Still be able to put a PEP or some sort of access gateway in front of the resource that they're accessing, still doing visibility and control mechanisms. I think the tenets of Zero Trust still apply regardless of really what it is that's being used, because to me, 5G is just transport in a lot of cases. Um, but what, where I do see 5G, at least in the cellular space, it seems like a lot of the 5G backend systems seem to be containerized, or at least be going that direction, which then typically leads us into a service mesh discussion, because then you need to start introducing proxies inside of the containerized environment to make sure resource A can talk to resource B inside of the containerized environment. Something to think about. Thank you, Jason. Um, there was a question about shadow IT. Gerald, you, you addressed that in the, in the chat. Uh, I didn't know if you want to add anything else to that. Uh, uh, no, I think, I think the most important thing about shadow IT is having good governance in place. Um, and that depends on how you organize your organization, what might work best. I know um, that department, you know, um, our, our, our last CIO, he kind of brought in and made sure all bureaus were represented so everybody knew what was going on. And, um, and information was widely shared and very transparent. And, you know, it was a governance committee. Um, and everybody had, had like a vote um, that might work in some places, might not work in others. But governance is very important. And I'm a big advocate for enterprise architecture, right? And if you're adopting zero trust as part of your enterprise architecture, um, as that security sub-architecture of the overall, then, you know, those are your guardrails now. So putting those in place and people following within those guardrails, if they want to, you know, be a system owner and they want to add a system to your network, this is exactly what, how you plug into it. And there's no questions asked kind of thing. That's governance. Um, that harkens back to governance. So it's not a, really a technical thing. There are probably some technical things that you could do um, to help understand what's on the network, what's talking to what, where's things going kind of thing. But all in all, um, shadow IT has to be addressed by strong governance, in my opinion. Thank you, Gerald. Another question we had uh, was, and this is uh, directed towards DISA or NIST, is there an authoritative list of approved products that have been vetted by either of your agencies? There are multiple lists. Is there one that rules them all? Once again, for DISA or NIST. I'll say from a DISA or DOD perspective, I, I wouldn't say that there's a, a zero trust list per se. Um, there are uh, capabilities that we'll be testing in our, our zero trust lab and, and in support of our reference architecture activities. Um, but that's not really anything that we're looking to pursue at this point. Again, I would probably point back to, to NIAP and, and common criteria as kind of the, the, the traditional foundation for validating a lot of uh, software and hardware products that we use. Um, so I think that's still relevant in this space as well. Over to you, Scott. Yeah, um, yeah, NIST, we really aren't in the business of creating lists of products. Um, you know, really the only certification-ish stuff that NIST does is really to labs that then do the certification for FIPS 140, uh, for crypto um, and V6 um, compliance towards the profile. 
Um, so yeah, we don't really produce those kind of lists except for like our own internal use. Um, I do believe, um, I know DHS and GSA has like their kind of lists of vendors that have been shown to follow you know, whatever processes they have uh, for CDM um, and I guess, you know, FedRAMP, things like that, that are you know, more easily approved. But, um, but NISTA really just helps develop those sort of criteria, but we don't actually do the uh, compliance checking. Thank you both. Another question, uh, what policy engines have been looked at? Um, not to name names, uh, but we, we is a bunch of vendors. Um, and really when we say policy engine, it's more, we call that as like kind of a logical component. It's more, you know, so actually you can have a distributed, you can almost think of it as a distributed policy engine where you have your device health checking that you know, as soon as a device comes online and tries to join the network, you're doing your device checks. And then the next stage where you know, identity checks and wherever you need to do those, you can think of those as you know, in totality of a policy engine. Whereas that if it actually got to the point where it's actually going through the PEP to reach a resource, the device checks have already passed. So you can already think, okay, that part of the policy engine has already been done and because you got this far. Um, so you know, so it, it's not exactly a single thing like OPA, whereas an OPA would be part of it. Um, you can think of that as kind of a, the idea is that a policy engine is more of a role than, um, or you know, so it could actually be a set of components um, than a single piece of technology. And in fact, if you look at a lot of vendors out there to say that, um, you know, a lot of their policy engines and the, and the way that their peps talk to the policy engines, uh, that's their kind of, you know, secret sauce. Um, so, you know, they kind of all do it in a different way and they kind of like to keep it that way. And that's why interoperability is sometimes an issue when it comes to some of these uh, solutions. Um, but, you know, we, we'd like to see that be a little more open. Thank you, Scott. I think we've got one last question here that I've seen. <clears throat> I believe this is from someone within the federal space. Where can I obtain a copy of the um, recorded presentation? From our, I'm sorry about that. That's the wrong, wrong question there. Um, the one above that, where would you recommend we go to get information and stay up to date on best practices for ZTA? Um, I could take a step at that too. Um, <laughs> there, unfortunately, there's no real good spot yet. Um, there is for federal uh, agencies that have access to the OMB Max. There's the uh, the Fed CIO, I think, on their space. Um, so they they have their, their the Zero Trust Initiative project over there. That's kind of what kicked off a lot of this stuff. Um, on the NIST side, there is the uh, the NCCOE project. Um, that state, I see it. there's another question about that. Uh, we've had over 100 uh, vendors and various other individuals express interest. Um, we're paring that down to a set of vendors um, and hopefully we'll be kicking off a bunch of scenarios based on access for that. Uh, but on top of that, there's going to be a community of interest and we're hoping to use that as more of a forum and an information exchange uh, to kind of both keep people abreast of what the, how the project is going um, but also maybe have discussion groups going on about, you know, maybe a, a deeper dive into some aspect of zero trust uh, with the, you know, the set of the set of the community. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at maybe using that as kind of like a kind of an information exchange point uh, for people that are interested in zero trust. I would add that there's at least three nonprofits that I know a lot of government folks uh, participate in along intermingled with the vendors. Um, that, that's going on as well. Um, so it, look out for those too. Those are some good forums as well. Um, and, and a lot of them are deriving from 800-207 um, and things. So there, there are some nonprofits that are doing some working groups as well out there. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Within DOD, we have a, a Zero Trust Action Group or ZTAG meeting that that is kind of our, our uh, working group at a larger level uh, for collaboration that meets on a monthly basis. So that's ran by DUD CIO. Uh, they also have a, an internal Intel, Intel link page that uh, they share for collaboration content as well. Uh, and then the, in, uh, the, the reference architecture will be published to the uh, Enterprise Architecture Review Board uh, portal here shortly. Um, and then we're working the, public, the publicly releasable version of that, which would likely end up probably on a DUD CIO's uh, library public facing website. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the uh, 
the questions from the attendees. Uh, I'll just go to each person, you know, a short uh, kind of parting shot, something you want to have everyone kind of take back from uh, today's discussion. I'll start with you, Scott. Uh, well, I'd say the first step is, you know, all being on the same page. Um, so like, you know, every, if you're gonna go down the road to zero trust, get everybody else on board, you know, both the owners of the workflows, the owners of the data, um, you know, the network operators, the security teams, you know, all have to kind of agree that they want to move to a zero trust architecture before any of this can even start. Thank you. Uh, next up, Brandon. Yeah, thank you again for the invite to speak here today. Um, again, I think this is a, a team sport. We all have to work together in, in what is probably traditionally very uh, different cybersecurity stovepipes. Um, so that'll be a, a big thing that we'll have to overcome hurdle, hurdle and, and culture wise. Um, so that will obviously have to continue. Again, I think uh, security is always a foundational piece of this, but I think also considering user experience uh, is also, also critical as well too of, of how we can make sure we're enabling people to do their jobs and access their data or mission systems in, in effective ways without putting too much barrier in, the, in place where again, they're gonna go around it or find easier ways to do things. <laughs> Um, so that's something I always like to add as an extra foot stomp, which you probably don't always hear enough in the, in the security space. Um, but, but again, I think it is a, a journey. It's a maturity model. Uh, it's a lot of things. It's not a box. Um, so those, those are kind of my, my cr critical takeaways. Thank you again. Oh, thank you, Brandon. Uh, Gerald? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, you know, it's a great group. Um, the other guys took all the all the good answers already, so I don't know much more to add other than, um, you know, to reference the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. Um, you know, um, definitely take your time, understand what you're doing, make sure everybody is on the same page, um, you know, all the things that have been said, um, and really understand what your risk tolerance is. Uh, um, I can't stress that enough, understanding what that is and, and what it is you're trying to protect. Um, the, you know, getting away from that peanut butter spread approach and focus on being effective. Compliance will fall in place, but be effective and protect what needs to be protected. Thank you, uh, Jason. Just a question for Jared. What's the answer to the ultimate question? 42. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, in all seriousness, uh, Ryan, thanks for putting this together. This was fantastic to get everybody together. Thank you. Um, and uh, I just have to do a shameless plug that the U.S. the U.S. federal team for F5 is doing their symposium in the middle of March. So if you want to hear, we try to keep this vendor neutral, and I didn't do any. Here's how F5 does zero trust talk. So if you're interested in that, please attend the federal symposium or reach out to your accounting. Thank you. Well, it's uh, we're a little bit over here. I'm gonna. Go ahead and, and say thank you, everyone, for, for joining. I really appreciate the panel.